So what we're seeing is our AirWatch per app tunnel service running, and I'm, I'm actually VPN back into my corporate infrastructure from here. So we can see that we're actually tied into our NSX domain back in our corporate data center. And if we scroll down, we can actually see that NSX is now controlling where this app goes from here. So let's dive into our app and see how this looks. So first we're going to launch our corporate application and it is loading. So I think we've all seen this, uh, this happen before. Um, we get this, this connection timeout um, or just kind of a poor user experience. Um, even though you're connected to this Wi-Fi back in maybe a remote office or branch office, let's see what we can do to, to, to make this better. So let's look here in our, our NSX SD-WAN by VeloCloud. Um, here we can see we have one of our branches. And as we click into here, we can actually see that we're no longer bound by a single link, but can actually utilize a diverse set of commercial grade broadband links to distribute our traffic across. So we're seeing traffic going across our AT&T U-verse and our Comcast cable. We can dive in a little bit further and actually see some more statistics like latency, jitter, packet loss. And from there, we can even go one step further and look at some of our, our real-time statistics. Look at what's flowing across both those links and actually that both of those links are actually being utilized by the traffic. And here we see even more details around TCP, UDP. Really, we're monitoring a lot of information. But where this comes into play is actually, how do we fix that user experience for that, that uh, business critical application? So let's click into our enterprise branches, business policies, and let's go ahead and define a new business policy for my AirWatch traffic. So it's as simple as creating a new role. Let's go then um, define the application. Scroll down to our business collaboration. And then we can find our VMware AirWatch um, apps. So what we're doing here is we're actually um, explicitly defining a business application role where we can enable some things like dynamic path selection or are really our multi-path optimization technique, which can provide per packet link steering. Uh, and, and when we do that per packet link steering, we're, we're taking into account all those kind of calculations we were showing earlier, uh, jitter, latency, et cetera, to provide kind of some re remediation techniques like forward error correction or, or activating jitter buffering. And really all of this the end goal is to provide that, that, that better user experience, that end user kind of experience that they're looking for uh, when they're actually connected in that branch. So let's click OK and switch over to our iPad to see if we've fixed our, our experience here. So now we get the loading screen again. So you can see our quarterly report has been generated. Um, user experience is great and it's actually all protected all the way back into the corporate data center through AirWatch and NSX. So as we click into our Tokyo branch, we see kind of our standard branch statistics from our SD-WAN by VeloCloud interface. And let's go and actually see um, from a con configuration point of view, how that connects back to our Washington DC headquarters kind of our main data center pieces. So from here, we can actually go look at our devices and click on our uh, guest segment that we want those kiosks to be connected into. So as you can see, we're actually peering back to our, our NSX domain. So what's happening here is that we're going to now get a bunch of routes, kind of those isolated segments uh, from NSX back into VeloCloud, back into our Tokyo branch for all of that reachability information for just our guest segment, completely isolated from everywhere else. So now let's actually go see what this looks like from our Tokyo branch perspective. So we're back into our Tokyo branch. We can scroll down and click on our guest network. As you can see, it's PCI, some other isolated segments. Click on our guest. 
run. And what we're going to come up with is those routing tables specific to that guest segment. So now we've not only secured the apps uh, that are critical, but we've also segmented it out the guest access for that new kiosk. So next up, let's actually go into one of our data centers and deploy a three-tier application. This isn't going to be your three -tier, traditional three-tier application. It's one that we made up across multiple workload domains. Our first workload domain is going to be our virtual machine. Uh, and this is a simple MySQL database. If we go into NSX, we can easily find that MySQL database, click on it, and we should see some of the details about the database within NSX, and more importantly, the tier of database, and our app is in MySQL tags. This is how NSX inherits the information. So next up, we're actually going to go deploy our app tier, but we're going to do so in Kubernetes, in this case, Pivotal Container Service. Uh, as we see here, we have our namespaces within Kubernetes. And if we go over here, we can expand to kind of see that these are all mapped to logical switches within the NSX data center domain. Let's go back to our console. And again, the console is something that probably your developers are going to be used to, uh, someone familiar with Kubernetes. Uh, and if we can go and actually look at the specification and scroll up, we can actually go see what the developer is going to see. And quite honest, this is transparent to the developer. They just have to add some labels to say, here's my plane spotter app. It's an app tier. And we're going to go inherit that within NSX directly. So let's go deploy our app. We've created our app. We can watch it up and running. And we're good to go. We can go refresh over here. And as we scroll down, we can now see our app tier has been deployed. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. That's really the goal of this. Okay, so next up is our front end. So our front end, we actually want to go deploy in Pivotal Cloud Foundry. So we have our, our Cloud Foundry console up, and we're, we're, we're basically running a set of commands that developers are going to be doing to create their orgs, tie their, uh, their spaces to the dev, and start getting their app up and running. So we move to our, our app, CF push, kind of similar YAML spec that we, we, we showed before, and, and our app will be up and running shortly. Great, so now that our app is up and running, let's go refresh, and now we can see our front end that's been deployed. So now that we have all of our networks up and running, let's actually make sure all of our firewalls have been automatically put in place as well. So here, as we scroll down, we can actually see that our applications are all in the correct firewall policies, all in place. So first of all, we actually bring a consolidated view with our cloud services manager. As we bring up our clouds, we can see our AWS instances and our Azure instances for our developers. Click on AWS, click on the instances, and then we can dive into say, let's go maybe just look at our hybrid VPC. We can scroll down and see our plane start, our front end that's been deployed in AWS. Go back, click on Azure and their instances, and here we can see our PlaneSpotter app front end in Azure as well. Next up, we can actually go over into NSX, click on our virtual machines, type in PlaneSpotter, and we can see that all of our apps are available within NSX domain as well with the corresponding networks and firewall policies all brought in place. So our new developers developing our new front end, no problem, got it covered. We're not stopping there, though. Ah. So what about that last piece of, I got some legacy workloads, and now I want to move into the cloud? You mean the shadow apps I built six years ago are probably still alive? Yeah, absolutely. Uh -oh. So so let's go look at our legacy data center, which has a number of Ubuntu machines available. Let's launch our NSX Hybrid Connect service. And here we can see we have a network extension service, as well as a Viga VM migration service up and running. Click on our extended networks. And as we load, we'll see that our destination network seems like a bunch of random numbers, but it will correspond to an NSX uh, logical switch once our migration is complete. Let's go ahead and migrate some VMs. So first of all, we need to select our VMs to migrate. But before we can do that, we have to select uh, some criteria. 
first our, our resource pool that we want us our destination to be next our data store that we want to select then the type of provisioning and in this case we want to do a bulk migration of the workloads so let's scroll down and select the vms we want to send over so we'll select uh, eight ubuntu vms um, bulk migration we want to move a bunch moving one maybe seem, seem simple uh, but we want to move a bunch over so uh, we can select our eight VMs that we want to move, click Next, and we'll do some very simple validation that we can proceed, click Finish, and then wait for our migration to happen. Simple as that, a few clicks, and we're moving our eight VMs over to our VMware Cloud on AWS service. Okay, looks like we've finished, so let's click over to that service. As we can see, we have our software-defined data center in the VMware Cloud on AWS. Click on some details of that service. We have it up and running and on our networks. So our networks will consist of a management gateway, our compute gateway, connection back to the on-prem, um, some of the firewall rules, and logical networks. So let's scroll down and actually take a look at one of those logical networks. Ah, here we go. We have those uh, digits that we talked about earlier as our destination network, which is an NSX-backed uh, logical network. And that's all we have it. I mean, just a few clicks, and we migrated our workloads over to VMware Cloud on AWS.